Okay, so good evening, everybody. So let's allow, uh, I think, a minute or two so that uh, others can join us and we'll begin the session. So this session, we're going to be looking at, uh, we're just going to overview the OSI model, look at variability. Some students on the mentorship they did uh, quite an awesome work in some of the assignments. We'll go through those assignments. Uh, we'll also look at the labs for uh, networking. Uh, some of the hands on we're going to be looking at in this call. Then we also look at, um, uh, let me just check a moment. Uh, I have three things I want us to consider today. Um, so the very first one is going to be uh, ITN lab review. So I'm going to review some of the labs that we're going to be considering for this, uh, uh, in this call. Then I'm also going to look at the Networking security fundamentals, this particular module here. Then I'm also going to be looking at some of the research uh, done by some of the students on the internship. Okay, so if you are hearing me uh, on the YouTube live, so you can just tell me, okay, I am uh, I am live. Um, you tell me your name and tell me where you're connecting from. We're going to begin in the next two minutes. Just tell me your name and tell me where you're connecting from. Uh, we're beginning in just one minute. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, so the very first thing we want to do is to look at the, the lab uh, overview. So let me try to sign in, just, just a moment. Uh, Okay, so, so if you're on the internship or if you're on the group uh, for the three months internship, you're going to see that we have uh, about one, two, three, four, five uh, courses that were running. The very first uh, course we, are, we just started like a few days ago is a networking for cybersecurity analysts. Uh, later on, we'll go to look at web programming, then we'll look at digital forensics, then we'll look at uh, the Cisco Cybersecurity Operations Associate. And of course, lastly, we're going to be looking at pen testing. If time permits us uh, before the end of February or early March, we can also touch on IT project management because if you are going to do incident response uh, planning, if you're going to set up uh, incident response team, or if you're going to be a member, or if you're going to do penetration testing, project management skills are so crucial, so important. So, We've started networking for cybersecurity analysts, and we want to look at some of the labs uh, so that we can prepare ourselves for next week. 
So in our review, there are quite a few I want to just uh, go through. Assignment sheets, just a moment. So there are a few labs I want us to touch on. So these labs are very, very simple labs in the sense that you can do them by yourself. If you check very well in the lab sheets, you have about um, one, two, three, four, five, six. I think they are about uh, 40 in number. Let me confirm. Let me confirm from the server security lab sheets. I think the number of labs we're going to be working on for the internship, the networking for cyber security analyst is about 40 in number. So, but there are a few of the labs that are very simplistic that you can try out on your own. And I want to use those labs to like explain to you what the labs look like and what kind of experience you can get by doing the labs. Then those ones that are a little bit advanced or a little bit difficult, those ones we're going to run those labs on, uh, some of them will run them on YouTube Live. Some of them will run them on uh, Zoom classes for the students on internship. So in the 40, I want to pick and explain one, two, three, four, five, six. So install Wireshark on Windows PC. That's lab 379. If you go to lab 37, let me sort this. Sort this. 379. That is this one. Now, in networking, uh, Wireshark is a tool that you can use for sniffing, right? Packet sniffing. You know, when a dog sniffs, a dog is trying to capture information. It's trying to, uh, a dog is trying to know what is happening. So Wireshark is a software. You now see most of the labs have some kind of background. And the objective of this lab is to make sure that everybody have Wireshark installed, right? So you could go to Wireshark. Wireshark download, and you install Wireshark, whether you're using a Linux system or using a Windows system. But for this lab, I would want you at this stage to install Wireshark on your Windows PC. Now, we're going to have Wireshark as part of the virtual machines that we're going to be using. Uh, let me see if I can sign up in one of the virtual machines. So whether the ethical hacker virtual machine or the Cisco server ops virtual machine, you are going to have Wireshark there. But for the sake of this lab, so any of this one, let me sign into this one. I'm going to tell you how to set up this environment, set up your hacking lab and all of that. We're going to, uh, going to do that later on. But now I want to have Wireshark installed on either your MacBook or your Windows machine or your Linux machine. I want you to install it by yourself. That's the goal of this particular lab. So the goal is to do what? Download and install Wireshark. So Wireshark is a software protocol analyzer. In the previous classes, we looked at protocol. What is a protocol? So a protocol is just a line in medium of communication. So there are quite a lot of protocols, about 65,000 plus. And these protocols helps network uh, uh, devices to like communicate, whether it's video, whether it's voice, whether it's... Um, What's it called? Whether it's uh, email. So you have things like SMTP, simple mail transfer protocol. You have things like file transfer protocol. You have things like uh, HTTP. You have things like uh, UDP or DNS. Uh, DNS as domain name server. You have quite a lot of protocols. Now, we've considered some of these protocols in our previous classes. Now, you want to be able to use the software to like understand what is happening in your network. And one of those softwares is what? Wireshark. So Wireshark, you could call it a packet sniffer. At times, it can also serve as a tool you could use to do for picture assessment. You want to run it on a network to see what and what you can capture in that network. And that's going to form basis of your suggestions for change, for, for patch, and all of that. So it is used for network troubleshooting, analysis, software and protocol development, and also education. And good enough, Wireshark is free. It's open source. Now, uh, so you're going to have data streams back and forth in Wireshark. So you want to use Wireshark to be able to know what is happening in your network. So what you just need for this lab is your PC and your internet access, right? Now, understand that you should be running this in your machine, right? Either in your Windows machine, your Mac machine, or in the virtual environment. Because I can bet you, if you run this uh, tool in 
uh, a it's a, an environment that you don't have permission to run. You might capture some things that you actually don't want to see. And that goes against the Cybercrime Act, GDPR policies, and so many policies. That's why for this internship, we're enjoying all students running this internship through us to actually submit this letter of intent. The letter of intent uh, tells us that you are doing this course for the right reasons. You are doing this course to learn. You are doing this course to better protect you not trying to do this to try to get to uh, where you're not supposed to get to. Okay. So, so all you just need to do is to go to Wireshark. Uh, if you're running 64 bit, select that. I think, I don't know if they are still compatible with 32 bit. I doubt most of the recent release, you could just have it in 64 bit. And of course, if you're running this internship, you're running this training, or you're following us in the, in the, in the group, you should have at least a 64 bit system. It will help you to install most of the softwares you need to install. I think that's all for this lab. Just download Wireshark, install, and you go next, next, next. And if you follow these instructions, you should be fine. But there's something here you need to be careful when you're trying to install Wireshark. Do not install the USB pickup for normal traffic capture. Do not select the checkbox to install USB cap. Uh, this is experimental. So just Keep the default install, uncheck the pickup, right? So that you just have, uh, what happens is that Wireshark uh, like makes your system to get into promiscuous mode. I mean, your NIC card, right? Promiscuous mode, I mean, it cannot help you to be able to capture packets that are not meant to it, meant for it. Because normally when packet moves across your network, information is transferred from one system to the other. You only capture what is meant for you, right? But once you install Wireshark, Wireshark acts like an adapter on your system, and now you're able to capture, uh, what was it called? You're able to capture even packets that are not meant for you. And that, um, that now gives you opportunity to be able to see what is happening in the network. Take, for instance, what can you see when you capture uh, packets through Wireshark? You can see username and passwords moving through across the network. So if somebody is using vulnerable, protocols like uh, FTP, right? Like SMTP, like uh, let's say TFTP. If somebody's doing some kind of HTTP. All those protocols that are vulnerable, that are in plain text, that are not encrypted, you can be able to use Wireshark to do what? To capture it, okay? So that's all for this lab. The goal is just to download and install Wireshark. So if you already done that, you're fine with this lab. So in further labs, uh, networking, in further labs, we are now going to be using Wireshark to view network traffic, to view NIC information, to uh, what else again? So there are quite a lot of things we're going to do in Wireshark in this networking course. And also, if you check the, uh, what was it called, the Cyber Ops course. Okay, I've not uploaded this. I think, let me open it from my system. Uh, it's in just a moment, Cyber Ops. Uh, labs. If you check these labs, you will see that you have. Okay, let me check it from the internship groups. Cisco Cyber Lab. You see that there are some labs that we're going to be doing that have to do with Wireshark. Okay, let me change it to details. So you have things like um, using Wireshark to examine HTTP and HTTPS traffic. Using Wireshark to examine TCP and UDP captures using Wireshark to examine DNS capture, all of those things we're going to be working. So there's quite a lot of labs we're going to be working on in Wireshark. So we're just trying to lay the foundation. We're going to do some Wireshark in networking. We're also going to do some Wireshark in, what was it called, in um, uh, cyber ops. So Wireshark is a very, very important tool you can't do without. Okay, next in the uh, series, we're going to look at user accounts on Windows. So which is lab 11223. So let me close this and go back to the folder. Labs, right? 11223. So if I scroll down, so user account. So this is this is going to help you as per foundation of some of the how the lab is going to flow. Now, in this lab, you want to make sure that you have Windows installed. And the goal of this lab is that you want to be able to have uh, Windows, uh, yes, you have Windows installed. If you have Windows, then you want to be able to create 
Um, let me see what the objective is. Uh, okay, create user account in Windows. Now, you know, later on, we're going to look at what we call privilege escalation, right? Privilege escalation. So privilege escalation is where you have persons trying to change their permissions. So somebody's permission can be a user account. So some people want to change from just a mere user account to an admin account. We call that a vertical privilege escalation. So somebody might want to change an admin account to another admin account. So in the course of this uh, learning, you want to be able to set up accounts on Windows, you want to be able to set up accounts on Linux machines and all of that. So the, 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 to do this lab, you just need to do step one. Um, you go to control panel, you click on user account, you go to user accounts, you click on manage another account, you go to manage account, you click on add a new user to PC, uh, you go to family, you cl click on add someone else in this PC. Then if you're running on Windows 11, you just say add account, right? So now change account type. Now, so you have different types of users on Windows. So you have a user account, you have an admin account. So you want to be able to know how to change those. So these are very elementary, these are very rudimental. So, but it's very important. You should be able to set up accounts, you should be able to set up systems. In some of the labs, you should know how to set up a Windows PC, you should be able to learn how to set up a Linux system. You should know how to set up a Mac system. So these are some of the labs you have in the uh, ITM because the way we did the labs that you have a combination of introduction to networking and also uh, what was it called? Information technology essential labs. So also to delete an account. So uh, especially when you are doing backups or when you have a system that have so much files that you want to like... Uh, um, you want to either keep the files or to delete the account and still keep uh, uh delete the files or you do a backup. So this comes very handy. It's just like uh, some persons want to do backup and restore. So some of those skill sets are very very important. Even at times when you are doing digital forensics, you want to see trail. You want to see old accounts. You want to see if somebody, if a user have maybe deleted an account or if an account uh forms part of a PC, or I remember during the time of, let's say, Windows XP or Windows 7, you see that a particular folder, you can slave a hard disk on a new system and copy the files out. So some of all of those things are very important. Deleting an account, keeping a file. So that is what just you want to learn in this, uh, in this lab. So you have some review questions here also. So for all of the students working on internship, you already have an email to submit your labs, right? For the very first tax that has to do with Wireshark, I just need you to indicate that you have installed Wireshark, you have it up and running. For this particular lab, uh, anyone that needs you to be able to fill up answers that is not, that is not already answered explicitly, you fill it up and submit to the email. Take for instance, why is it important to protect all accounts with a strong password? So you say no password or weak password can allow access from almost anywhere to steal data or use the computer for unauthorized purposes. So you have a question, you have an answer. Why would you create a user with standard privileges? Because in Windows, for instance, you have use, uh, uh, user types on Windows. Right, so you have standard, admin, and guest. So you should be able to understand the different types. Take for instance, because of security measures on an enterprise, you want to set up an account for people to use, right? If you set up a guest account, they won't be able to install uh, softwares. So the type of account to set up tells which kind of permissions ordinarily you are going to assign to those users. This is very, very important this is very fundamental so you have standard you have admin you have guest right so for windows 7 this is an instruction of on how it can be done on vista this is how it can be done on xp this is how it can be done for newer version i think you have 
uh, you could just Google that up. You could say set up, set up new user on, let's say if you're running Windows 11, right? You can always stick to the Microsoft site because most of those help and guide are available on, on the, uh, what's it called? On the, on the, uh, their documentation. So add or remove users on Windows 11 and 10. So you have a detailed instruction. Now, one classic skill set that you need as a security analyst is what? Research skills. Because later on, we're going to be learning OSINT, Open Source Intelligence Gathering. So this is not something you should be asking, asking somebody, okay, I want to open, set up an account, or I want to give somebody access to a system, but I don't want to give the person full privileges, right? So here you get it in the uh, Microsoft support site. So see the instructions, just like we have it in the lab. Okay, so I think that's the end of that particular lab. In what type of situation would an IT administrator delete a user account and choose to keep the files of that user account instead of deleting them? So answers may vary. The user account is an employee that's, that has been terminated and the files contain required business information that should be retained. When we start learning web programming, either sometime at the end of this month or in January, we'll learn how to do this on emails also. You see that if you want to manage a web server, somebody is new in a company, you can give the person an email address. Once the person is going to be uh, fired or the person is going to be under probe or the person is going to be under probation or the person is going to be under some kind of investigation, you want to be able to pause the person's email. This person should not be able to access emails again. I think I can do that right here. I'm logged on on the server. We're going to learn this, I think, sometime the end of this month or in January. But let me just show you here. So I have this email account. I can say, receive incoming email, allow. I can say, uh, sending outgoing email, allow. Logging in, allow. So at times, when you are doing forensics or when you are doing some investigation on an account that is hacked, one of the things you want to do is at times to suspend the, that particular email from receiving email or suspend that particular email from uh, sending out email so that you can gauge and understand what is happening. Another thing you could do is to ask your hosting provider to stop or to pause SMTP because SMTP is Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. That's the protocol that is involved in sending and receiving out emails on the server. So you want to tell the hosting provider, please pause this particular email for me. I'm trying to investigate one or two. Or if you if you if you find out that maybe maybe there might be data exfiltration, data exfiltration, I mean that um, somebody might be trying to download some information from the website, or somebody is trying to upload emails on the server or on the website to like run a tool to be able to do something bad. You can tell your hosting provider to pause or to suspend FTP. That is file transfer protocol. Once that is done, it will be difficult. You typically cannot upload emails to a server. So these skills, these knowledges, uh, or this knowledge is very, very important when it comes to, uh, like for instance, this is for a user. This is for a system. So I just explained to you how this also applies to an email server or an e, uh, a web server. Okay, that's all for this uh, tax. So this tax is, is very simple and just set up an email, set up a user account, delete it and keep the files. Uh, for where you are trying to practice this, you can set up a user account, create one or two, three documents there, then delete the user and see how to back up that particular user on your system, right? Very crucial, very important skill set. Okay, let's look at the next one. The next one is share resources. Okay, so this is lab 11524. 11524. 11524. Do I have it here? It seems I made a mistake. 11524. Okay, so 11524. So what you need here is two computers on the same network to be able to do this lab. 
So to do this lab, you need two computers on the same network. So you could have a desktop and a laptop, or you can have a laptop and a desktop. And the reason why we did the lab this way, and all of the labs are going to be considering through the internship about 180 of them, we made it in such a way that you can do the labs yourself. They are detailed. And if you have any questions, you can ask in the uh, mentorship group or screenshot your issues. Um, I, myself, I or other trainers, they will help you. Or other students that have done something of that nature is going to assist you, is going to help you. Right? You see, the instructions are very detailed. So I'm just walking you through some of these simple labs so that you can trash them out so that during the internship, or sorry, during the, the, the lab sessions, we can now work on the more uh, harder or would I say complicated one. But those ones also, you, the rest ones you have, they are also very well detailed. So something you can start trying out, you can start working even ahead of the class. So now, you know, if you are to network two systems, you want to do like a pair, a pair network. You want to do like a uh, networking two systems together. You want them to share resources. Now, if you want two systems to share resources, they must have network sharing enabled. So that is what you want to learn here. In this lab, you will work with another student or you can work with yourself if you have two systems, if you don't have two systems, get another system or get a friend that have another system. What you want to learn, you want to learn how to share files. This is where you can also learn how to install printers. We're going to see that in the subsequent labs. So because if you don't establish network sharing, it means that you can't share files, you can't share printer, you can't share hard disks. I remember a classical example is, uh, I remember sometime in 2005, yes, 2005, 2006. It's quite a long time now. Uh, it was an XP system. Let me tell you what happened. I think I was somewhere to purchase some, some, some tech items, some network cables and all of that. And I found that that there was a challenge in that in that uh, like that store. Somebody had a system, and that system was like uh, I think Hasse 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 is an Hasse Hasse is like an lab uh, is like an Asian brand. It's not too common. Look at it here. It's not too common. And back then, the way drives are done, let's say a CD drive, they don't do CD ROMs to be same across vendors. So it was a challenge for that particular system to be set up, for them to like format it and drop files and all of, all of that. And then you didn't have external hard disks. I think I had one or two I imported, like an adapter that can help me to slave a hard disk to a system. Slave, I mean that you have the system, you have the hard disks, you want to connect the hard disk as a USB to the system. So how do you do that? You need an adapter, something like this. Um, USB hard disk adapter, right? Something like this. So then this thing was also common like that. Now, any computer shop have this. I remember that I imported my own, or not really imported. When I was coming back to uh, the country, I brought in some. And it was very rare. The 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 this the what was it called? The pen drive you had them was just five one two MB. So you didn't you didn't have like two hundred gig, five hundred gig one. You didn't have all of that there. It was not so common. So you only have maybe banks or maybe big organizations having something even up to like hundred or two hundred gig. Now they there was difficulty in that store like setting it up. Do you know what I told them? I told them, okay, I can fix this for you. And this is a hardware issue. I had a Pentium 2 or Pentium 3 desktop in my room at home. I had, a, I had like two laptops, a Toshiba and a HP. Now, what I did was that I did this. I picked two systems. I picked this Hasse laptop and my Pentium 3 lap desktop. I networked both of them. That means I enabled network sharing in one and enabled network sharing in the next one, connected a cable amongst them. I slot in a CD-ROM. So I just go to the CD-ROM, something of this nature. So this system I have doesn't have a CD-ROM, right? So I right-click the CD-ROM, 
go to properties, go to sharing, go to advanced sharing, and just share the folder. Once you share the folder, if network sharing is enabled on this laptop and network sharing is enabled on the other desktop, you can connect a cable, right? And this drive here is going to be seen on the other system. Once that is possible, once you just click on network, you're going to see all of that, right? You're going to start seeing the hard disks that were shared on the other system. Once you do that, I now started installing all of the things that were necessary to be installed on that system. I think at the next day, I took back that laptop then, and everybody was shouting, okay, what happened? What happened? What did you do? What did you do? Now, this was a hardware issue, but networking was used to solve that particular problem. So here, we're trying to learn how to do what, how to share files, how to share folder. Here, we want to create a folder and share it. So that's what this lab is about. So the instructions are clear. Go to start, go to settings, go to network and internet, go to properties, click on private, go to change uh, set, uh, sharing settings, go to network discovery, go to files, go to printer sharing and follow all of the instructions and you'll be fine. So you're going to see what is going to happen if you don't share properly, right? So uh, delete the share folder. So once you are done with everything you are doing, once you also delete that folder you have shared. Else, if somebody connects with, to you on that network, the person will be able to see everything you are doing. So I want you to try this also. If you have issues, drop it in the group. Uh, we discuss them. Uh, because these are very elementary. If you have issues, you drop them because we are going to, in the Zoom sections, we are going to be considering most of the ones that are kind of uh, a little bit harder. Okay, uh, let me know if anybody have any questions so far before I move on. So I have, uh, I need to touch on uh, lab four. Okay, let me touch on lab 14315 because that's a research work. 14315, just a second. 14315, 14315. So, okay, Francis, you have a question, just a moment. I'm going to come to you. So now you have you you call this uh personal identifiable information. I think this is called personal health information. Uh, I think this is uh confidential information, if I'm correct. Now you want to be able to investigate breaches of this by searching the internet and record your findings, right? So uh, personal information, including health and financial data is compromised by both human carelessness and sophisticated computer network. Uh, as an IT professional with devices, uh, and personal data, it is important to be aware of the wide range of attack and vulnerabilities that have occurred. Now, you know, one thing a security analyst needs to understand is that you don't need something to happen to you before you um before you learn. You need to be able to learn from what has happened in the time past. I think it was yesterday or two days ago, I was dropping some voice notes on the group where I talked about intelligence, I talked about Talos, I talked about virus total, I talked about uh, uh, common variables and exploits. So some things have already happened in the time past, right? For instance, if you say, have I been pound? You want to know if your email have been pound, if your email have been hacked. Typically put your email here. Okay, let me put one, contact at southtechventures.com. Let me check. Have I been hacked? Okay, request for bidding of, okay. Maybe it wants me to put a normal regular email. Why is it forbidding me? Okay, somebody should try this out and let me know your result. What this site is going to bring out is going to get you and tell you if your email have been in any cyber breach. What's a cyber breach? A cyber breach is an occurrence where data have been stolen or data have been exposed. But right? that's what you call the cyber breach. Now here, what we're trying to do is that we're trying to investigate if personal health or financial data have been exposed, right? So this lab, you just need your PC, your mobile device with internet access. So 
Uh, in this part of the lab, you research and describe three breaches that have occurred recently, including at least one PCI, one PHI. Use the following steps. So launch your favorite browser, go to google.com. What key terms will you use to search for recent breaches, right? You type your answers here. Go to the results and find the most interesting breaches that have occurred in the last five years. For me, uh, you could keep this to just... Um, Two years so that you get something very recent, right? Choose, uh, I'll open, uh, I will ask, I will let you know when I need you to ask questions. Choose three different breaches to document in this lab. Uh, describe the breaches in detail. Make sure you, uh, you answer the following questions, right? Like, for instance, if I say, uh, top cyber breaches, cyber breaches, uh, in 2023. Right, so this is November 16. This is November 16. This is November 17. Imagine in just this month alone, right? So what you want to do is that you want to research this, you want to learn. Now, one of the ways you can also learn as a security analyst is to understand what has happened in the time past because it also forms your knowledge base when you are creating your own solutions, when you're trying to advise your clients. So, Nothing, like I said, nothing mustn't have happened to you to be able to tell your client, okay, this is what to do, this is not what to do. So you can learn that from what has happened in the past. Okay, so you, okay, what is the source of your information? Include the URL. So for this particular lab, I need everybody to run this and submit. So I'm going to update the assignment sheet so that you can do this lab yourself. Submission deadline can be maybe sometime next week. Right. Okay, so... uh. You have questions, just indicate, or you could drop that in the chat. Um, if you're on the YouTube live, you can also drop in the YouTube live session. If you're on the Zoom uh, link uh, session, you could just drop your question in the chat and I'll attend to them. One minute for that. Okay, so I'm waiting for your questions. If you have questions, just drop them. I think this might be the lab, this might be the last lab review uh, before we get to review the assignment. Then we'll talk about network security. Okay, so please, uh, Francis, you can go ahead. You can use your voice. You can ask your question. Thank you very much, sir. My question is on the first file sharing, just like you said that after we finish, that we should be able to um, close it and go. If not so, I'll remove it. If not so, that other person will be able to look at what we've done, that if another person connect on our network. But my question is, does it does this file sharing and serves as the same thing like using like TeamView and the AnyDex? Because I know in any desk you can access file in any way if the person, as long as the person connects the same thing with you, they can access everything that the person has in a system. Or is it any way that you can configure any desk or team view to be in restriction, just like the way you did in this account and this uh, file sharing that is account uh, access to? Okay, the, the normal thing is that there are two different things. Okay, this first one we talked about uh, sharing files. Let me see if I can get the lab. Uh, that should be lab what share resources now when you are when you are sharing in um what was it called when you are sharing in a, a windows pc right or a linux pc you have full control like i could just create a folder here i could create a folder look at this cyber security folder now ethical hacker labs in the ethical hacker labs i have 31 labs right I can say, okay, OSINT tools. I want to right click this and uh, more option, properties, uh, general security details. Let me see if I can see some fine detail, advanced a moment, security. I see I can edit who have permission to full control, modify, read and execute, read, write, and special permissions. I can do all of that here. I can do that 
this is the original owner. I can change it, right? I can assign somebody else on this on my network to have access to either a file or a folder. If it's a folder, for instance, I can right click this entire ethical hacker labs and say uh, properties and go to sharing. I say share and uh, I add this. I just say share, right? So it then means I'm not set up a network on this system. So if I set up a network or enable file sharing, uh, this is my personal system. So typically there are some things I don't enable. So I can share, right? So anybody that connects to my network or the, the, the same network I am on, the person would see that file. So you have a finer grain of access control. But it's quite different from any Dex, TeamView, Skype, because in that model of um, collaboration, what happens is that you give the person full control. Like I can go on Zoom. This is a Zoom call that is streamed on uh, YouTube. I could go and say, hand over, hand over the control. So that's where you're trying, you're actually doing, you're using the remote desktop uh, computing protocol, right? So you are going to hand over the entire permission to that person at the other end. And the person has full control of your system. It's completely different from you trying to just share a particular folder. And if the person goes to the network, it's only a particular file. So there are two different things. One, if you are sharing a file or Windows or Linux or whatever, the operating system, you have full control. If you are doing remote, any decks or whatever to any person, the person, and you give the person permission on your PC, the person has full control. Sometimes if I, I'm assisting somebody or a student or I'm consulting for an organization and we need to do some jobs remote or over the internet, they just give me full control and I can do anything on the system, right? So you, you, you don't have any restriction. If it's to share a file, uh, Zoom, any decks, uh, team view Skype. Uh, I don't know whether Yahoo Messenger still does uh, remote uh, stuff. If you just a file you want to share, most of them have chat feature features. You just drop the file there. Is that clear enough? Oh, yes, sir. Okay, somebody is asking on the YouTube live. Please, what's the meaning of PII, PHR, and PS? At PC, I think I said that uh, personal identifiable information, personal health information. I think the last one is uh, personal. Uh, let me confirm just a moment. PCI uh, PHR. Uh, okay, payment card industry data. Then you have personal health information. Then you have personal identifiable information. Now you see this PCI. P PCI DSS is a framework. Is like a license that's needed by. Uh, any company that's going to process payment, like Flutterwave, Paystack, uh, to checkout, Stripe, uh, uh, all of those companies. Now, those data we're talking about is like your PIN, is like your 16 digits number, or, or depending on the whether it's Visa or MasterCard. So those kind of data is what we call PCI data. Then of course, health information is things like your age, your what your gender, what health information you have, then your personal identifiable information has to do to be those things that concerns you, either maybe related to your bank or your, your all of that. Okay, one more question before we be right on. Uh, you can drop in the chat or you can raise up your hand. I will give information to ask. Umani Dani, I hope you got the feedback I gave to you. If you're on the YouTube live, you can just tell me where you're connecting from and uh, you can drop your questions if you have any so far. Anybody question? Okay, let's try it on. So let's assume this to be the last overview I'm going to do. Uh, so this uh, 14315, that is 14315, these have uh, quite some tasks you need to work on, uh, work on, who was affected, who was targeted. Uh, so this is you trying to learn some cybersecurity research skill set. Because one thing you go to also do as a security analyst is to write reports. Mm -hmm. So you see, you know, at times enthusiasts, newbies might be thinking that, okay, um, 
I want to be a secret analyst. I just I just hack, 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 hack. No, my brother, my sister, you are going to write reports, right? Because the person you are dealing with is a C level executive. You are dealing, you are dealing with his chief technology officer. You are dealing with a C CEO. A CEO does not understand all of those. I'm using Wireshark, I'm using uh, Nmap, I'm using Azos, I'm using OAPZAP, I'm using uh, Bob Suit. I'm, they don't understand all of those jargons. We have over 180 labs. So imagine uh, you are doing uh, Nmaps, Capy, Wireshark, Kali Linux, uh, Browser Exploitation Framework, Social Engineering Toolkit. You are doing Browser Exploitation Framework, Papa like we say in Nigeria, uh, they don't understand all of those things. So you will need to address them. You will need to write a simplistic is and was report. And this research work is you building your skill set for that. Because if any company is going to spend money, you need to tell them in plain English why they need to spend that money. All of the jargons you're going to do behind the screens, uh, scene, even if you do a technical report, you need to also now do an executive summary. That executive summary is going to be something like, okay, what happened? Why it happened? What do we have at stake? Why did this even happen? What do we need to do? What are the countermeasures? So how much do you need? Because maybe if you need to buy a software or you need to be able to implement some security measures, you need to tell us, why we should why we why we should do that? Why should we spend a thousand five hundred dollars to on the software? So you need to the, the, running those software or those tools is not the issue for an executive, a C level executive. His issue is you need to tell me why. And doing some of all these things is going to help you build some of the skill set. Okay, so I think you have another one, 16 to 6, 16 to 6, uh 16 to 6. That is this one, research network security uh, threats. So this is another very simple SANS. So I, I, I normally encourage my students to sign up on the SANS uh, news blog. It has quite a lot of uh, news, quite a lot of uh, information, quite a lot of uh, content that can help you. So, uh, to defend a network against attacks, an administrator must identify external threats that pose a danger to the network. Security websites can be used to identify emerging threats. So that's what we call intelligence gathering. And provide mitigation options for defending a network. So one of the most popular trusted sites for defending against computer network security threats is sysadmin, audit, network, security science, so this site provides some kind of uh, content on what is happening. Like this one we just checked now. I think this is a blog also. This is telling us this is updated as of December 1st. It has uh, given us details about some of these attacks that has happened. So this, this I think, hospital, this uh, college. So we can actually imbibe some of this learning because you see one duty of a security analyst in an organization is to create incident response team, is to also train and retrain. Because there's what, in social engineering, there's what we call, or in cyber there's what we call social engineering. That is the weakest link in information security. So if the front desk officer in your company does not understand that if given a flash drive or a pen drive, if told to click a particular link within the office network and compromise the entire network, if he or she does not know, no matter what you do at your level, you can be attacked. So that's why training and retraining is also very, very key. I think this company now, for instance, they are doing a lot of tabletop exercises. They are trying to like create plans for companies to like know how to prepare for attack and all of that. So, so... For this lab, you just need a um, device with internet access. You need presentation with PowerPoint and other presentation software installed. So um, where will you be getting some of these resources? Reading rooms. So I normally tell my students to subscribe to the reading rooms on SANS. So if you go, if you say SANS, 
sans reading room, right? So they have some white papers and some research work. So you can just subscribe, but if you don't want to subscribe, you can come from time to time, let's say once or two times a week, and just read about and know what is happening, right? Another thing you can do as a security analyst is that you can open a dedicated email, and that email can be for most of this your research stuff. You could go to google.com slash alerts. You could look out for like 5, 10, 15 keywords that interest you, and you could say cyber breaches, right? You can say, I want to get information on cyber breach. And you can say, okay, I want you to, I want to be notified once a day, or I want you to, I want to be notified immediately as it happens. For some of us that are into blogging, for some of us that you see, I think in the previous classes or the previous, uh, I think on the YouTube channel, I have a video that talks about non-technical uh, cybersecurity rules. Research is a rule, right? Technical writing is a rule. Uh, uh, security uh, gadgets, security software, security whatever marketing is a rule. So those things are not technical, right? So if you have a flair for blogging, you can set up a blog in next, I think next month or thereabout, we're going to start learning how to program, how to set up a website, how to set up an e-commerce site. Once you've learned how to do that, you want to set up a blog and you can create an alert system for yourself to watch out for some keywords and you create those alerts. Once I create this, my email is going to be flooded with this, anything all over the internet that has to do with cyber breach, I'm going to get the email, right? So look at payment giants, TPAL, T, no ransom breach, no threat to. So you get to understand what is happening across the internet. You could put cyber security news, cyber security, cyber breach, ransomware, all of those things that interest you that you want to write about on your blog. You can monitor the web for interesting new content. So this sans reading room is one way you could get some of this content. So the step two is locate the link to the CIS. That is the critical security controls uh, room. The, you're not told to select one of the controls and list implementation suggestions for this control. Let me try to do this first part for you. So I will just right click. I will say sans reading room. Okay, let me say sans critical control. CIS version eight. So that eighteen of them. Okay, let me go to this another site. Let me go to the direct site. So here we're trying to learn about the different kind of controls that security analysts need to be aware of, and how they can apply that to the organization. So normally. At, at a high level, we we'll say administrative, physical control. Administrative controls are those kind of controls that you implement in an organization to help make sure that you're not vulnerable. Okay, just a moment. Let me open it. Uh, so uh, the latest is version 8. Let me see if it is here. Good. So you have inventory and control of enterprise assets, inventory and control of software assets, data protection, configuration of enterprise assets, account management, audit, email and web pro protection, malware defense, data sec net recovery, network, is petition testing. So these are different kind of uh, critical uh, controls that you can implement in your organization. This was the older version. This is the newer version. Right, so you have details here. I think that there might be a document. Let me see that uh, that expands the content. Just a moment. Okay, I think this is it. So download the CIS control. Let me see if it's going to be a document. Okay, look at it. Learn about the CIS, CIS controls version eight. So this is case studies. Assess, the, I think they have a cost. I think it's at no cost. Okay, this is a very nice one. So if you have time, I think you can take this course. 
awesome. So you have one, two, three, four, five. It's just about uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. 15 minutes. Yes, 15 minutes and you're done with this course. I think I would drop that in the in the session. And let me see so that I can I've dropped that in the Zoom link. Let me drop it in. Let me drop uh So let me drop, let me save this link. Uh, let me save this uh, in the link so that I can drop in a general group for people that want to take this very short course. So this is about uh, controls. Okay, so, so you see malware defense, employ automated tools to continuously monitor workstations, servers. So these are some controls. Now, why are these important? They're important for your what? Network security threats, right? You want to know what those threats are, and you want to know the kind of specific controls you can implement for those different specific uh, types of threats. Okay, uh, so identify sites providing reset security threat information. So there are so many sites that can uh that can provide you heads up, right? I think this should be. A moment, uh, network security threats. This should be module 16 of the ITN course. Just a moment. This should be module 16 of the ITN course. So let's just touch it a bit. So there are quite a lot of sites that can, that is going to, let me see if it is here. Okay, it's not here. Let me see, I doubt if it is in there. So I doubt if it's in the uh just a moment. I doubt if it's if it's in ITE. Is ITE up to 16? Okay, it's not. So I'm wondering. Just a second, let me look for it. Uh okay, I can't find it. If I find it, I'm going to drop it for you guys. Okay, so identify sites uh, providing uh, recent sec uh, security threat information. So you can answer that aside, aside sans, which are other websites. List some of the recent security threats detailed on their website. Then see an example. Wanna cry around somewhere? The type of attack, the dates of attack. Later on, I keep mentioning digital forensics, digital forensics, because see, digital forensics is about knowing what has happened. So uh, why it happened and who made it happen. Now, see some of this is they are very, very related because if we see an indicator of an indication of a compromise, we want the only way we can prevent future occurrence if we know all of these things I just mentioned. So that will help us to like learn. That will help us to train our employees. That will help us to like create our playbooks our incidents response plan that will help us to be able to update our policy document. Our, our po information policy document for the company tells us what we should do, what we shouldn't do. So imagine somebody, if you spend 30 days doing a lot of research, it can help you create an awesome knowledge base so that when you are creating a plan, you create a very nice one. I think one course I'm also going to find time to record and push out to the YouTube channel is something on um, information security policy development. I think it's, it's part of one of the courses we're going to be considering. If it's not part, I will do a series on uh, information policy document development. The process is actually for you to do an audit that you learn from standard guidelines. That means you look out in the internet and see uh, uh information policy uh PD, let's say you want to see check out for for a bank 
uh, you say PDF, right? You want to learn from standard guidelines. This is for general small bank. This is for CCB. This is for consumer microfinance. So any of these document that you open, this is for CBM. This is for called Hack Bank. This is for MSC Bank. So you, it depends on whether it's a bank, whether it's a school, whether it's a consulting firm. You want to learn from this guide. Imagine this one how the... Oh, so in this is the kind of projects we're going to be working on. I told you guys about. So we can write this bank, right? So this is... Uh, where did we get that particular stuff from? I think it's this one. Let's see if it is, they have, their site is active. Okay, their site is not active. Let's see if their site is, uh, is still, it has not expired. Okay. So the question now is, this site was registered sometime this year, is expiring next year. Uh, it's in India, right? Uh, now the thing is, why is it not up? So if you find this kind of thing, this is this is a, a simplistic way to do bug bounty, or this is a simple way, simplistic way to like, uh, why is this stuff? Okay, let me check if it's going to return an IP for me. Oh, sorry. Ping mscbank.com. See if it is active. Okay, so it's returning an IP address. This is the host, right? So we could dig in and get more information. I see if it's a real business, we can write to them and tell them we want to help them to fix all of this malware and all of this stuff that's happening. If we do this for a hundred companies, at least 10 will reply us. And we could do that for free. We could tell them you're going to uh, pay us um, whatever you feel. For a newbie, you can do that and develop a portfolio of persons, organizations that you've you've helped fix, maybe hacks that have happened on their applications or their network or their websites and whatever. Once you've created a, a, an amount of uh, portfolio, then you cannot determine your price. Okay, so I was just talking about uh, information security policy. So you create an information policy, right? So this is going to help the organization have a very good uh, posture. Okay, so let me get back to uh, uh, part three. So this is just an example of how you're going to do yours. Because I think this part is already done for you. What steps can you take to protect your own computer? So you have an answer, you have an answer. So you have to supply to me answers for those parts that doesn't have an answer. Okay. I think the last one is a customer information in your work order. So this is, I think this is for laptop repair. So I will skip this. Okay. I think the last part of this uh, session is that I'm going to now consider uh, we did some assignments for the students on internship. So let me start from the very first one. Let me answer them as they came. So I think for those of us that have been following the training, either on the mentorship group or the general group, in the previous class, we talked about OSI model. So OSI model is Open System Interconnect. It tells how uh, computer systems communicate over a network. Now, we're trying to learn this in networking. Our real goal, our real interest is to understand not just how the systems connect. That's not much of a big issue to us. Systems are going to find a way to connect, whichever way. What we're interested in is what is the vulnerability associated with each layer, right? So, you have physical layer, data link layer, network layer, transport layer, session layer, presentation layer, application layer. So if you're joining this call uh, on YouTube or on WhatsApp and this is new to you, you can check the channel. You're going to see a complete series on introduction to networking. Now here, what we want to do is that we want to see the vulnerabilities associated with each layer 
And I want to review some of these assignments. So I will just review a few of them. Then I'll open the room for questions. Uh, okay. Okay, so this is from Francis. Let me expand this. This is from Francis. Uh, networking for cybersecurity analysts, variability of each layer of the OSR model. Okay. Now, uh, application layer. Okay, let me start from the physical layer. I'd like to start from this right down. Now, while trying to understand the OSI model for the physical layer, what are some of the vulnerabilities that might happen? Tampering with cables, equipment is dropping where you're tapping. Now, you know the physical layer have to do with your cables, with your Ethernet port. Now, I love uh, one of the students that started working on the countermeasures. So as a security analyst, it's not enough to understand, okay, there's OSI model. The question is, how are you trying to make sure that you secure each of your layers? Right? Okay, welcome, uh, Nimi Ishele. Yeah, right? Uh, thank you for connecting from a uh, Uh, Patients, welcome, Umani, welcome, Abdul, welcome from Jigawa State. Uh, Don Sensel, how are the students going to do the file sharing lab assignment since they are far away? For this particular lab, like I said, uh, you could um, you could get a friend system if you have it if you have two systems, you could do that either a desktop and a laptop or two laptops or two desktop. You able to run through this lab. Okay, I think that is all the feedback from the YouTube channel. If you're on the WhatsApp call, if you have questions, just drop on the chat. I'm going to see that now. For the physical layer, you see that uh, your interest is like I said. If you if you implement the best software. If you are paid millions of dollars to protect an IT system or your infrastructure or an organization, if people can get access to your devices, if people can scan your devices, if people can have physical access to your devices, I can bet you that you are compromised already. Right? So at layer one, two, three, kind of similar, but here what's going to be happening is IP routing. So, um, okay, let me examine the student that did something on, uh, uh, let me see, let me see, let me see. Somebody did something on, uh, if you did something on countermeasures, just pick up, let me know, or just indicate in the chat so that I can review that one and uh, I'd like to do research. Okay, I can't find it. So let me just continue with that one. Okay, so uh, uh, tampering with cables for Data link layer, MAC address. We know that they are two, right? Um, uh, VLAN, so VLAN is virtual LAN, right? So VLAN is a way for you to, for you to segment your network, right? So imagine you have a switch, you have a switch like this. Let me minimize this. You have a switch. Switch VLAN. You have a switch, let's say 48 ports. You now break it into parts. I think most of us have got the most of us have got the materials for, for routing switching and wireless essentials, right? If you go through, I think one of the modules you see. Uh, VLANs uh, uh, explained in detail. Let me, so if I have a switch like this, so I could say one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, that is eight port is going to be for marketing department. This port is going to be for uh, tech, tech department. This port is going to be for executives. This port is going to be, so you can break. So instead of having, one LAN, second LAN, third LAN, fourth LAN, as in different switches, you can use one switch and just segment it. So that's what VLAN is about. 
So if you're using a switch, especially if it's a managed switch, you can actually configure it as segment. One way, one good advantage of doing VLAN is that you could do a lot of access control. For instance, you can say all of, all of these guys can access this IP. All of, all of these guys can access the internet. These guys cannot. You're on the same network, but you cannot access the internet or you cannot access some certain things. So that's one of the advantages of, and it also helps you to, to do proper network management. Right? Um, so that is, uh, so one of the things you could have in a, one of the vulnerabilities you can have in that particular layer is VLAN hopping. So VLAN hopping is where somebody can move from one LAN, one VLAN to the other, right? So then you have ARP spoofing and poisoning, right? Because ARP, the protocol, um, is address resolution protocol. So that's the protocol that it's you that it's the aids the DHCP server to like assign IP address, right? And also resolve it if they have issues. That's why it's called address resolution protocol. Okay, Bami Dele, you, you raised your hand, you have a question, you can use your voice, uh, permit you yourself and ask. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I just want to clarify, uh, what you said about the particular uh, user of that uh, specific port may not be able to access internet. I want to know whether internet provided by the company or can can he, does that mean if he use uh, uh, a, a hotspot from his own phone, he cannot course, see, he cannot course, provide internet to he, that. Uh, he port. will be able to, but once he's on this network and he's connected to this particular switch and this, uh, 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 let's say this is fast internet, this it, uh, internet port one, port two, port three, port four, port five, port six, all of this LAN are assigned to VLAN 10 and access control have been implemented on VLAN 10 not to access the internet. Provided your cable is plugged there, you're going to not see any internet. If you leave and you connect your system to with your hotspot or with your own router, of course you can. So that's one way to do maybe bandwidth management, network management. I've I've uh, a consultant friend of mine. He developed a software, then for a hospital, but found out that the hospital because there's what we call software maturity. If you develop a software for an organization and they don't use it. That software will die. Death, I mean, it's on the usage that they will have new needs, they will have new requirements, business requirements, and you can improve the software. So once the software gets improved over time, it becomes usable. It becomes something they can't do without. Since they will not be able to do without it, they will be tied to the software and they will be hooked up with resubscriptions and the usage of the software. So imagine you sell the software and they don't use it. What happens is that when it's time for renewal, they might say, okay, we don't, we don't, we can. So this, the member of staff of this particular hospital, we're not using the software. You know what the guy did? <laughs> this is not something you should do actually. The guy went to the network, coffee the network, found that, checked their history and found out that they were doing a lot of YouTube, a lot of Instagram, a lot of Facebook. He blocked all of those sites, right? So they don't have time to do all of those unnecessary stuff but they will typically spend time using the software, entering data, instead of doing the manual stuff. And imagine if top management comes in and says, are you guys using this stuff? They say yes, but they're not using it. Because until, until they use the software, they will have issues. They will report to him. He will fix. He will be seen as working. Then the software can mature. So with time, within one, two years, the software cannot command a higher price. Right? So for an organization that one doesn't want their staff to be able to access some part of the network or an IP or the internet or whatever, or to, to be able to do several other things. You could just say top 10 advantages, advantages of VLAN, right? So the, the security, so many reasons why you want to VLAN, right? Solve broker's problem. Imagine if you have a 64 port switch or you have a switch that have quite a lot of ports, 100 and something ports, and once data or packets is sent, you know, it's going to send to everywhere. 
but imagine if somebody from here is sending somebody to this place, it just go to you're just restricted to this particular collision domain, as we call it, right? Or it's going to be to just uh only this particular section. So the reasons are service device management easier, logical grouping of device by function instead of location. So functional uh, 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 structures for some companies that might have this department, this department, this department, this department. So you could you could sort it out that way. Okay, hope I answered your question. Any other question before? Yes, you do. You do, sir. Uh, as well, for for example, I didn't be there is a particular department uh, the organization does not want to access internet at all, whether through personal hotspot, you know, or other means. There could be no, something to no. be done to. No, the thing to, is that. To sorry to call you. The thing is that okay. if it's going to be, if you except you are managing that device, because any device that you don't have hooked up to a hardware or a software, you can't manage it, right? Uh -huh. Except except there's a software installed. If you install the software on that particular system, good then you cannot manage it right take for instance if you install if the if the if the what's it called if the device is hooked up to let's say microtic for instance so that means that uh, you're going to have a captive portal you want to have something like this or prtg if you if you are running the software so this is this is a hardware PRTG is a software. So this is network monitoring. Then if you are running something like this, you have it in hotels, some companies, once you, tr once you try to access the internet, you get something like this, you must log in. So you might be using a hardware, Microtik. You have other hardwares, you can be running this. So once they are connected to you, you can you can you can configure the system to do what you want it to do, or you are running a software like this, and there are several other alternatives. So if if you are not if the system is not connected to your solution hardware or network, you can manage it, right? Okay, so let's write on. Okay, I think I'm going to write on uh, with the review. So you have a uh, transport layer man the middle attack. So this type of attack that scans the network for open ports, services, and vulnerabilities, right? So when we start using tools like Nmap, we will learn about what what do we do with an open port? What what does an open port translate to, and the rest? Then sessions, of course, you know, a session is just a time in action for a particular event in a software or a network. So a type of attack that attacks over an existing session between two devices that intercept or modify the data. So what you want to learn from this is, is typically what happens. For instance, very critical is the application layer. So this is where you have application. This is where you have softwares, especially for web applications, network applications. So uh, here, later on in the course, when we start learning web security, we're going to learn about SQL injection. So SQL injection happens at the uh, application layer, right? Like most of these labs, uh, these ethical hacker labs, something like a browser exploitation framework that happens at the application layer, right? Uh, which other one? Anything that has to do with OAPs, Open Web Application Security Project, that happens at the application layer. So typically, all of the attacks you're going to be seeing that you're going to be finding out is going to happen in one layer or the other okay i think that's just a little overview on that particular one let me pick one let me pick a okay somebody said something in the chat prince will uh okay okay this is a doc let me open it so if you're on the YouTube live and you are learning, let me know you are learning and let me also know where you are connecting uh, from. Okay, so nice one. So application layer, what are the potential vulnerabilities? You have it here, SQL injection, insecure data storage. So you see most of this stuff, we're going to blend them in detail when we start doing web 
uh, security. Uh, you see, most of these things are covered in OAPS. Let me open the documentation, OAPS, top 10 list sheets. So you have a detailed documentation of all the different kind of attacks that can happen on a software, right? Uh, this is it. This is uh, the actual link, right? So you see it, broken access control, cryptographic failures, injection, insecure design. So you see all of these things listed. And there is a document that tells, uh, just a moment. Twenty twenty one. This is it, right? So this is very very detailed, right? So it even have look at them. It even have detail about the attack, right? The description of the attack. They how to prevent it, right? Let me drop this in the chat, and I also drop it in the general room later on. Sorry. Okay, I've dropped that and I'm going to update uh, our resource sheet. So this is just for broken access. You could check for injections, you could check for, so all of these are all of the kind of vulnerabilities that you can have associated and their description and of course how to prevent them. So if I were you now, I will go and spend time and start reading some of these things. I understand them. I don't understand them. I will just read them so that once I start doing web programming, it will not be the second time I am going through them, right? So because these are the things that a programmer should focus on. Now, that's why it can cost you $100 to build an application. It can also cost you $2,000 to build the same application, right? So there's what we call the security tribe. So we call it um, uh, security tribe. Not actually, not this one. Uh, just a moment. Let me see if I'll see an image to remember it. Uh, not this. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, GUI. GUI versus security versus. Um... Okay. I think let me just draw. Let me open my. Let me open Notepad and just draw it. Just a moment. Let me do a ship. And have a round ball. Oh no, a triangle. Let me have a triangle. So I'm going to put a, a round guy here. Or oh, let me just put a square shape here. Put a square shape here. And third one. So here, um, we're going to have a ball. We're going to have a ball. We're going to have a ball here. We're going to fill the ball with uh, this. We're also going to duplicate the ball in three places. We'll put the ball in different positions. ball here, put another ball here, maybe put this ball here. So I can call this security, security. I can call this uh, GUI, call this ease of use. I call this um, functionality. Uh, so now the thing is, if you are creating your security controls, 
the question is that do you create a functional system? What do you mean by a functional system? You mean a system that functions, a system that works. Let's say it's a network. So the network serve as our uh we can use our network to share files. We can use our network to 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 print to to like uh, do some kind of printing work. We can use our network to like collaborate. I remember some time ago we set up a software on a network that can people can use to chat. I think WhatsApp was not that common then. So you could use for so the internal team members can just chat once. I think it's the Python program that they can chat within the the network. So all of these things are different functions of a network. If it's a website, you have e-commerce. A website is functional because it's an e-commerce website. If a website is functional because it's a logistics website. A website is functional because it is a blog or it has a landing page where people can contact us. So a website can serve different functions. Now, for GUI, graphical user interface, ease of use, here we're talking about how easy is it for people to use that particular application on that particular network. Now, security. Here we're talking about how secured is that system. Now, so the question is that if we're designing our system, where should we be? If we were setting up a secure system, we will not, let's say the job is $1,000. If we spend all our time putting in controls, multi-factor authentication, did quite a lot of stuff here, what is going to happen is that we will not have time to create a functional system and we might set up a, a lot of security features on the website. It becomes so hard for people to use. If we make the website so easy or the network so easy for people to utilize and whatever, the question now is, we're going to lose on security because where we're trying to make it easy peasy, uh, lemon squeezy, it, 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 we're going to lose out on security. Right, we are creating very, very flashy. You see some websites, some networks. Just uh, we are concerned about speed for a network, for instance. We are not implementing security controls. We are not implementing bandwidth management. We are not implementing access control. For a website, we are we are just interested in making a flashy homepage, nice graphics, nice nice UI UX. We are not thinking about security. I've seen a website that is that is deployed today. And tomorrow it is hacked. I've seen that. <laughs> right? So if we do this, we we'll lose out on this and on this. So let me ask a question for those of us on YouTube Live or those of us on uh, on the Zoom link. So where should you be? If you're creating your systems, what should be considered? If you're on the YouTube, if you're on YouTube, you could just drop your answers on the chat box. If you're on the Zoom link, just uh, raise up your hand. I will give you a opportunity to ask a question. I should run into this, run up this call in the next, let's say, ten minutes. Okay, Bam Dere, you have spoken. Let me give somebody else opportunity. Francis, you've spoken. Let me give somebody else opportunity to speak. I'm waiting. Those of us on YouTube Live too, you could drop your question. I, I mean, you could drop your your. Somebody said security. So why did you say security? So you have to give me reason why. You need to tell me why security. And forget, don't forget if if your ball is here, if you choose your ball to be here. You know what is going to happen. It now becomes so difficult for people to use your system. I'm waiting for answers. Okay, Okwadi says, Okwadi says, I think balance is most important, so my ball will be in the middle. So your ball will be in the middle. Okay. Uh, I have an analogy to explain using element of fire. Okay. Let me get one more two before I give you opportunity. Okay. Middle is fine. Okay. That means we'll keep it here. 
So we another here, we another here, we another here. So we maintain. So are there conditions where you want to keep it here? Are there conditions? Have you seen some sites that are not so fine, they're not so nice, but they are amazingly secured? Um, if you keep it here, that means it's going to be close to say you, your system is secured, easy to use, but you might lose on this. So there are a few things that can play a role, your budget, your time. It's just like secure and user-friendly. So imagine you have a site where a site is worth, let's say, uh, $1,000. And because of security, you want to implement uh, two-factor authentication. And you don't just want to use email because people can have disposable emails. I hope we know what disposable emails are. Disposable emails are emails that you could just, there are so many of them, right? So many of them. You could just create an email, use it to register on the site, and it, it's available for two days or three days or 24 hours, and you trash it out, right? So people are going to be having dunk emails, right, on their system. But you said you don't want people to have access just like that. You want to confirm everybody. So you want to send them an an SMS. If you need to send SMS to the site, I look at this one now. I could create an email and copy it. And once I drop it on the site, send email, it will keep coming here. I think it's valid for two days, right? Now you're going to find out that, uh, just a moment. Someone says, I think all three should be considered equally. So I agree with uh, Isakwad. Okay. Uh, let me go back to the to the image. So, so the, the job, the site is worth, let's say, $1,000. Now, what now happens is that you have, because you want to implement that two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication, so you, now have, you, you want to now send SMS to everybody. Imagine if you have... 1k users each 1k users throughout the lifetime of the use of the of their, their app let's say it's a application site or an exam site they will need to get otp like 10 times right and it costs let's say 0 0.5 cents or let's say three naira or or let's say 0, 0.0 rand if you're in south africa depending on the country or dollar or cents or whatever amount. So you're going to say three times 10 times 1K users when you are planning your budget. So it's going to be 30. So this, let me not say K. This is one, two, three times 10 times three. Okay. My first degree is mathematics, but I seem I'm forgetting most of my mathematics. 1,000 times three times uh 10 so 1000 users three naira per sms 10 sms throughout the lifetime of maybe one month during the recruitment registration all of that so i'm going to spend thirty thousand. sorry is it thirty thousand? yes thirty thousand. Now, let's say you are consulting or you are building a site for, let's say, uh, UTME, UTME, let's say, uh, users uh, for exam. UTME is just an exam uh, in 2023. So let me say... I want to, okay, 80,000 candidates to sit. So each of those 20,000 candidates, 20,000 candidates who have to, have to account 20,000, so have to account for their SMS fee. So I have 600,000. And imagine you just charged, let's say, a million to implement one or two things. So already, 
600K, that is 60% of that fee is going on implementing just one security measure, SMS. I don't know if that makes some kind of sense to you. So imagine if you're implementing maybe one or other, two other things, or maybe you're implementing an API. Let's say you are implementing an API that is going to verify each and every email. Let's say zero bounce. I think after this, I'll, that will be the end of today's call. Let's say you're implementing zero bounce. So zero bounce is, an, and you have so many of them. You just say email verify. Email verify. Uh, system, you're going to see email hunter, very failure. There are quite a lot of them. So imagine zero bands and you have, let's get a calculator for the site and see how much it's going to cost us. So here you could do validation. What the software does is that with your API, you can validate each email to be sure that it's a real email. Have you seen a site where you enter an email and they tell you it's a wrong email? What are they doing behind the scene? They are authenticating. They are validating each of those emails to make sure that they are real emails before you even get into the site. Now, see, they are chatting me up and telling me, okay, it's going to cost me $65 to validate 10,000 emails. Okay, I need to validate. Let me see if I can get a calculator, please. Just a second. A pricing. Okay, let's say I want to validate... Is it 10,000? How many did we say? It? I think, okay, 80,000. 80,000. Sorry, how many did we say? Uh, how many were we calculating for? Somebody should remind me. We're calculating for 80,000 80, students. Okay, 80,000 persons writing the exam. So, if we need to validate for 80,000, so, and imagine those 80,000, uh, their first time is going to cost us $444. Now, if we want to check for the SMS, it's going to be 80,000 students times 10 times, very, no, uh, for the SMS, maybe the first time, reset password, all of those, OTP, 10 times, times, three Naira. So this is going to, sorry. So this is going to cost that security measure 2.4 million Naira. The email is going to cost us $444. So we're trying to do some. So 300, just call it 400K plus 2.4 about 3 million alone just to validate email and do OTP via SMS. So security can be actually expensive, but if you tell the person, okay, to set up this site is going to cost you 10 million, or you hear that the website was good for 10 million, you say, wow, I can build this website. What you're thinking about is actually, I can do this. I'll be there. You are saying, I can do this. Or you are shouting, I can do this. You're not thinking about this. Okay. I think that's uh, in a, a nice place to end the call for today. So I'm able to review all of the assignments. Uh, I think for... I, I love this. This is nice. Malicious la uh, presentation layer. So these are the things that are possible. So... Um, when we start doing cyber ops proper or web security, we're not going to go into using labs to like understand how some of these things work. Okay. Three minutes, questions. If you have questions, uh, please drop on the chat or raise up your hand. I will let you ask questions. If you have feedback, I will trash them out and um, we'll call it today. If you're on the YouTube live also, you have questions, you could ask and let us answer them and uh, so you now have an idea about how the labs are structured so you can now start looking at some of the labs and attempting them before we begin the lab by 9th of december okay so please questions
Okay, somebody is asking a question. I say, so what happens after the eighty thousand emails are verified? Is it that no email to be verified anymore? No, that's just the units you bought. If you if you if you if you exhaust your eighty units, eighty thousand units, uh, or if the number of your 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 users are more than eighty thousand, it's just like units when you buy units. So you want to verify emails, right? So the the way the system works is that the programmer can implement the API of that zero bounds of that site on his application so that once somebody types the email, it hits zero bounds server and returns back to say if the email was correct or not. If it's correct, it will allow you in. If it's not correct, it will tell you that please type in the correct email, depending on the message that you want to serve the users. Okay, any more question? Last question, please. Okay, so uh, good night, everybody. See you in the training group. Good night, sir. Thank you, sir, good for the night. course. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Good night. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you, sir. Bye bye. Yeah, nice book. Yeah, good night. Good night, uh, Austin. Good night, on you. Good night, uh, Innocent. Yeah, good night. <sighs>